All right, let's turn to uh, Psalm chapter 125. Psalm chapter 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like a Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of weak, uh, wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch, stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evil doers. Peace be upon Israel. So it starts with those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. So the people who truly holding on to the Lord, they're, they, they're like rock. They're like a mountain. They, they, they don't move. But people who don't trust in the Lord, they always change their mind. They always shift their, their, their mindset all the time because... They're not uprooted based on a strong base. And this is one of the things that I kept mentioning to everyone. Where do we actually build our faith? Where do we build our house? On the rock. Unless we actually build a strong base, the house will always be shaken and the house will not be you know, stable. So we always have to actually put our trust in the Lord so that we be like Mount Zion and cannot be moved and abides forever. So we truly have to just to stay on the Lord. Chapter 126. When the Lord restores the fortune of Zion, we will, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue would shout of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortune, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who saw in tears shall reap with shout of joy. He who goes out weeping bears uh, the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his uh, sheaves with him. This is one of the things we also talked about this. If a farmer does not put his effort and put his sweat to really just, you know, seed all this um, in the springs, and obviously he will not going to harvest anything in the, in the fall. This is not about we need to work very hard to make more money. This is not what it's about. This is about God's work. If we don't put our effort if we don't put our things into you know God's work obviously there's nothing to reap if you don't really just teach others about God's word there's nothing to reap we are sent as disciples and apostles to really just tell the world about the about Jesus the reason our church is so weak these days are because we don't say anything about Jesus anymore. We barely talk about Jesus in church. Literally, barely in the church. Not to mention about going outside and talking about Jesus. When we actually speak to other people, Jesus is not in our conversation at all. Right? We come together as a Bible sharing like this. We come together as a church. We talk about the Bible. We talk about the Gospel. We talk about Jesus. But where does the gospel go? Where does Jesus really go from here? Literally, it dies here. It doesn't really go any further than this. That means we don't seed anything. There's nothing to reap. Right? We have to truly, as the verse 5 says, those who saw in tears shall reap with shout of joy. 
He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy. Which means, if you don't saw anything, there is no joy. When we saw, it means we saw with tears. When you, when you compare the life of uh, apostles, disciples, especially like Paul, what was his life was like? Was, was, was he living very pleasant life and just like without worrying about anything? What did he do? He traveled around places where he, where people don't welcome him. He traveled to many different places because of those people. And then he preached to those people. And town and the city where he went, he was persecuted. He was beaten up. He was locked into the, uh, uh, the prisons. He was not loved by people, but he wouldn't mind. He wouldn't stop. He would just keep going. Whether they listen or don't listen, he continued to preach to those people because there was so much of a passion in his heart, so much of a love in his heart that he had to really just tell the world. He was the truly a light to this world. He was true salt to this world. Is that just Paul? Is that just the disciples? No. We are the disciples. We are the apostles. We are sent to this world. We're not here to just talk about the Bible and then lock ourselves in and then stay in this temple. That's not what we're supposed to do. When we actually saw, we have to saw with tears. Those are the people who saw with the tears will reap with joy. And this is something, oh yeah, I know this. Yeah, this is not about understanding. This is about doing it. You know, we talked about this for a moment. It says, even in this world, no pain, no gain. It's almost the same concept, right? Without sweat, you're not losing any weight, right? So then what does people do? People want to lose their weight. What do they do? Do they really work out hard to lose their weight? They just uh, suffer not eating those like delicious food they love? Or they want to rely on something? Oh, I heard about this a pill. I heard about this like diets, you know, the, the programs that we can just, uh, you know, the sign up and then just to buy the bulk, you know, bunch of products that we can take it to lose our weight which way people go sweat it out more or easy way people take very easy way they don't want to sweat it out they don't want to put their hard effort into it if you don't put your hard effort you will never be able to do what you want for example let's assume that there is a people who love to like learn piano how to play piano right you love music and you want to play piano what do you do if you don't put effort and practice you will never be able to play the piano right right piano is about playing practicing if you don't put your effort into it you won't be able to play piano well same thing even in this world it's almost the same concept not to mention about preaching the good you know good uh, preaching the good news to this world 127 unless the lord builds the house those who build it uh, build it labor in vain unless the lord watches over the city the watchman says awake in vain it is a vain that you rise up early and go late to rest eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, the children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb of reward, like arrow in the hand of a warrior, are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who 
fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. This is go perfect, perfectly with the, uh, the passage in the uh, Psalm chapter 126. Okay, we put our effort to see the result. We put tears. We put actually effort to just to reap with joy, right? What if in God's works work just like it? We put our effort and we get the results. When you look at the Bible, that's not always the case. Why? This is exactly what 127 says. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So no matter how hard we work, if God is not behind it, whatever we put in and the result that we get is not what we expected. God has to protect and God has to guard and God has to watch over in order for us to produce. For example, we could actually preach the good news and we put a lot of our labor into it. But if God is not with me, that is not God's work. We actually do lots of church activities. We do a lot of things. We go on missions. We go do things. If the God is not with us, whatever we do is meaningless. We actually build a, a building or house they put a cross on top of it. We call it a church. But if God is not in the church, whatever we do in the building is meaningless. We call it, oh, I have done this, I have done that, our church has done this. What, what good is it if God is not with us? If the Holy Spirit is not working with us, we are not relying on the Holy Spirit. We're not relying on the, you know, God's work. We're doing all by ourselves without God's help. God, I want you to stay away from us. We can handle this. Just leave us alone. I can do this. Let's let's just to put our effort together. Let's do all all this work by ourselves. Let's put all our effort. Let's do it. Okay. I'm sure we can produce something. I'm sure we can actually pursue some results. But that's not God's work. This is what Matthew chapter 7 comes in. Jesus, didn't we actually just prophesy? Didn't we actually drive out demons? Didn't he eat with you? Didn't we actually learn from you? Didn't we actually follow you? The Lord said, I don't know you. That's the scarcity part. Part. At the end time comes when we encounter the Lord. If Jesus says, I don't know you, that will be a big problem. What are we gonna say? What are you what are you talking about? I have done this, like I have a list of things that I've done. Do you know how much money I put in the church? It doesn't mean anything. It's meaningless. It doesn't matter how much money you put in. It doesn't matter how much hours you put in. If God is not with you, if you did not do the things with the Lord, what we did is meaningless. Same goes with the worship service. We actually just go in church and then we says, oh, I said in the sanctuary, I actually gave the worship service to the Lord. What if God does not accept your worship? What good is it? Isn't that the story between... Um, Cain and Abel, both actually, you know, built an altar. They both gave offerings to the Lord. God accept Abel's, but God did not accept Cain's. Why was Cain upset? Because he gave things to the Lord, but he did not, he did not accept his offering. So he was upset. How come you don't accept my offerings? How come you only accept my brother's offering? 
He was jealous. He was upset. So what, do, what does he do? He kills his brother. That's what people do. It's not about what you did. Who you work with. All your work was with the Lord or you did work without the Lord. What result do you expect? Your hard work and the result? You work very hard. You study hard to get to where you are today. The job, whatever possessions that you have, right? You put a lot of effort to build what you have. You may say, oh, God bless me. Really? Did really God bless you on that one? Or was it your hard work? Most of the people think, I put all my effort to build and have what I have. Remember, it's not about just the hard work. Did you work with the Lord? Or without the Lord? Once again, let me read one more time. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you're, uh, you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, the children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward, like arrow in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Bless is the man who fills his quiver with, with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Once again, whatever we do, I ask I asked you to work with the Lord, rely on the Lord, and as I always mention, who are we? As long as you believe, as long as you believe, you are strong, you can do things by yourself, there's no room for you, there's no room for God to help you. Where, where do we start? Is I am nothing. I own nothing, I can do nothing. That's where you start. Why? Because we came as nothing. And we will leave as nothing. We just realize that through the scripture, Bible tells us we are nothing more than a dust of the earth. That's where we start. Because of that, we rely on the Lord to help us. Because I can't do it myself. I could only do it when God helps me and strengthens me. Then I can do everything. That's the concept we learn. Can we save ourselves? No. Can we work very hard to save ourselves? No. We need Jesus to be saved. There's no other way. There's only one way through Jesus. Chapter 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like fruit, fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, though, shall be man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children's peace be upon Israel. So it starts with, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His way. Fearing the Lord, I mentioned many, many times. We start fearing the Lord when we get to know Him. When we get to truly know who He is, we will fear Him. For those of the people who does not know God, they never fear God. They never fear God. This is why when you actually go to, you know, 
I don't know whether we'll be able to actually just to cover uh, Proverbs today or not, but let's just do, jump to Proverbs chapter 1 for a second. Proverbs chapter 1. It says, verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. What does it say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Well, we're going to talk about this when we get to the Proverbs, but fearing the Lord is knowing who He is and who I am. If we get to know who I am, and who God is, I don't have to tell you to fear the Lord because you will fear the Lord. So that's why Psalm chapter 128 says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His way. Knowing who God is is it critically important. 129, greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, greatly have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrow. The, lo the Lord is righteous. He has a cut the cords of the wicked. May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turn backward. Let them be like the grass on the housetops, with, which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not feel his hand, nor the binder of the sheaves his arm, nor do those who pass by say, The, bless, the blessing of the Lord, uh, Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Of course, from old days, people have been persecuted, Israelites. But why? Why did people? Why did actually God allow the surrounding country to persecute Israel? God used the surrounding country when they were not following and listening to the Lord to discipline Israel. Even though they were persecuted, what happened? They could not prevail. Why? God was always protecting Israel. Will God protect us? Absolutely, He will protect us. We know that God will protect us. However, do you truly believe that God will protect you or protect me? Many people don't believe that. Many people don't believe that. Many people think, if God protected us, why people die for those are faithful people? Why do they die? God never said, you will never die. God never said, you will never be persecuted. An opposite. God said, you will be persecuted and you will die. Even faithful people die in sickness as well. God never promise that you will never have sickness. God never promised you will never face any death. You will. I will. We all. However, when we do God's work, He will always be there for us. He will always give us a strength. That's why apostles and disciples were able to do what they did because God was with them. Not because they were strong. Not because they were better than us. Because God was always there to help them. That's the difference. Chapter 130. Out of the death I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice so that your ears be attentive. To the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, shout mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, 
there is a forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and His word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning, O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is a steady, fast love, and with, with Him is a plentiful redemption, and He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. Do we really wait for the Lord? Do we really wait for the Lord? Most of the time we don't wait for the Lord. We wait for maybe a week, and then what do we do? Oh, God's not answering. I'll, do, I'll have to do it myself. We don't wait for the Lord. We want things to be answered. We want God to answer the time that we need or we want. God does not really just to work in our timeline. God works in His own timeline, not by my timeline, or not what I wish. Most of the time, God works in His own way. His way is different than us. But we, ex we expect God to work in my timeline, my way. I want you to do it my way. That's not how God works. We have to know who He is and how He works. And this is what He says. Out of the depth I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. So is the author being suffering? Is he actually in trouble? Yes, he is. That's why he's crying out. In depth I cry to you. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my plea for mercy. So, the author is in pain. He's in trouble. That's why he's crying out. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is a forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits in his words, I hope. Where does he put his hope? The word. He put hope in word. This is why I kept mentioning you need to know the word, what promise God made, who he is, so that we can put our hope and trust in words. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Imagine if the watchman stands all night do you think he waits for the morning to come so he can get some rest? I think so. I will. The watchman is waiting for the morning to come. All night. Diligently. Really seeking. The morning to come. But does the morning come the way I expect? If I wished... Oh, I wish the morning come in two hours. Does the morning come in two hours? No, it doesn't. Morning comes when it comes. It does not work the way I want. That's how God works. So it says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in His word, I hope. And we need to put our hope and we need to really just trust in His Word that He protects us, that He will guard us, He will be our rock, He will be our shelter. One thirty-one. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like the weaned child with its mother, like the weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And almost the same thing what I just mentioned. We need to really put our trust in the Lord, even though He does not answer the way He the way we we expect.
132. Remember, O Lord, in David's favor all the hardship he endured. How he swore to the Lord and vowed to the Mighty One of Jacob. I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty ones of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in uh, Ephrathah. We found it in the field of Jaar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstools. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let's, let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away, away the face of your anointed ones. The Lord swore to David a, sh a sure oath, from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, your sons also forever shall sit on, my, uh, on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless the, her pre, uh, provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priest I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have pre prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. When you look at the verse 7, let us go to his dwelling place, let us worship at his footstools. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you, uh, you in the ark of your might. So, ark of might, ark. We talked about Noah's ark last week, right? Noah's a family stayed in the ark and was able to spare their life out of all this large amount of waters. So staying in the ark is being saved. And he's saying, same thing, let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstools. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place and you and the ark of your might. Remember, I always mention that we need to be in resting place at the end. God actually rested on the seventh day. So many people think, oh, seventh day, the Sabbath, we have to rest. We don't. We should not do any work. We just have to rest. And do nothing, right? And that's what Jewish people do on Sabbath. They don't even ride a car because they have to rest. But is that what God was talking about? And I mentioned, did God really rest it? Did God really just tired and He had to rest? No, as we saw. In the uh, Psalm chapter 121, God does not even sleep. God always at work. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't rest. So what does that mean? He rested on the seventh day. Seventh day, he rested means he is bringing us into the resting place. That is actually explained in Hebrew. Let's actually go to Hebrew for a second. Hebrews chapter 4.
actually starting from verse um, We're going to read from verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned? Those bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, uh, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although he, his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in, in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news to fail to enter because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day today, saying, through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today, if you heard his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had, had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged swords and piercing to the division of souls of the spirit of joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intention of the heart. And no cre uh, creature is uh, hidden from his uh, sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we might give account. This talks about what? It talks about entering into the rest. It was a reference on the seventh day when he said he rested. What does that mean? We need to enter into the rest at the end. So then, I told you many times, why, did, why didn't actually Moses did not lead them to the promised land? I told you that Moses should not be the one who leads the people to the promised land. Instead, Joshua needs to lead the Israelite to the promised land. Why? Because Joshua equals Jesus. Jesus is the one who is going to bring us to the promised land. And we have to enter into the rest, his rest. All right, coming back to Psalm again. Chapter 133, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the colors of robes. 
It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has a commanded the blessing life forevermore. This is like anointing Aaron as high priest. When God actually made Aaron as a high priest, this is what they had done first. God actually anointed all priests. And for those who are anointed, what do they need to do? We need to work in unity. Unity with what? Behold how good and pleasant is when brothers dwell in unity. Which means, brothers and I have to actually make unity. So, when you actually go to the um, book of Acts, second. Let's actually turn to not the book of Acts, let's go to uh, Philippians for a second. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to read from verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. What is he saying? He says one spirit with one mind. Within the church, this is what's, this is what's important. So, Turn to chapter 2. It says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation, uh, participations in the Spirit, any affections and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambitions or conceit, but in humanly, uh, humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. 
So, church needs to be in what? In one spirit and one mind. And one purpose. All right. Coming back to a psalm. We're going to jump to chapter 136. Chapter 136. Chapter 136 is about um, giving thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steady, fast love endure forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for His steady, fast love endure forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His steady, fast love endure forever. To Him, who alone does great wonders, for His steady, fast love endure forever. To Him, who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endure forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endure forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endure forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endure forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endure forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endure forever, and brought Israel out of out from among them, for his steadfast uh, steadfast love endure forever, with a strong hand and outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endure forever. To him who devised the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endure forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it. For his steadfast love endure forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endure forever. To him who led his people through, his, uh, through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endure forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endure forever. And killed the mighty kings, for his steadfast love endure forever. Shihon, King of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endure forever. And Og, king of Hashan, for his, love, his steadfast love endure forever. And give dear land as a heritage, for his steadfast love endure forever. A heritage to Israel, his uh, servant, for his steadfast love endure forever. It is he who remembered us in our low estate, for his steadfast love endure forever and rescue us from our foes, for his steadfast love endure forever. He who gives a food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endure forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endure forever. Whatever he does, because of his love. He does everything with love. Remember, if you summarize the entire book of Bible in one word, means love. This book is about love, nothing else. He did everything, not only to Israel, but to us, to the church. Why? Because of His love. Because of His love. Nothing more, nothing less. And this is the part that we need to remember. Therefore, thank God that He loves us. Thank God He loves us. What if He hate us? Then we'll be in trouble. Chapter 137 By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept, when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres, for there our captors are required of us songs, and our... Uh, Tormentors, mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. He shall, we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land. If I forgot you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skills. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember. O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, 
how they said, laid bare, laid bare, down to his foundations, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed. Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall be, uh, shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. I, I'll, I'll, I'll share something. When you actually read this uh, psalm, does it remind you of anything? Does it remind you of anything at all? No? So this psalm is about the Israelites who brought, brought, and so it happens, what happens is Israel, the south of Judah and Jerusalem was completely destroyed. And they brought to Babylon as a captivity. Or when they actually brought up to Babylon, they're sit at the Babylon rivers and watching on the east side, I mean the west side, and thinking about their, their country. What happened? What happened to us? When you think about it, what happened to them? Why did God destroy the Judah and Jerusalem? Because they, they've been faithful to God? They listened to God? No, they did not listen. God spoke to them many times through many prophets, but they would not listen. They continued to Refuse to listen to him. And God had to destroy him. If you remember the story from Jeremiah, he cried for his own people. Try to just have them listen to it. So literally, this song is about the songs they're making at the riverside, crying out. Right? By the waters of Babylon. There was a set down and wept. They're crying. They wept. When we remember Zion, on the willows there, we hung up our lyre. For there our captors required us, require of us songs. And our tremendous uh, tormentors, mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's songs? in a foreign land. How can we actually sing about the Lord at the foreign country? So then I say, why didn't you do it well when you were in Jerusalem? You should have listened to God, but because they did not listen, they now regret for what they have done. They did not listen to the Lord. So verse 5 says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skills. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem, how they say, said, laid bare, laid bare down to its foundation. Edomites making fun of them. Sad. But, Interesting. When I was young, I actually know about this when I was young. Through a song. I don't know if you know this song. Do you know the song, Rivers of Babylon? Do you know who sang that song? The Rivers of Babylon. It's a band name, Boney M. If you actually know who Boney M is, that means you're old. <laughs> if, you, if you know the Boney M, that means you're old. If you don't know who Boney M is, that means you're young. <laughs> so, let me actually just uh, 
chapter 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answer me. My strength of my uh, of souls, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O, o Lord. For they have heard the word of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For uh, though the Lord is high, he regard the low, uh, lowly, but the howdy he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hands against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endure forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. When you listen to this, it says, verse 2, I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name of your steadfast love and your faithfulness for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. What is lifted up? Your word and your name. And this literally just, you know, ties to the chapter 137. He's a steadfast love. He's steady, fast love. He's always loves us. And that's something we need to remember. And what to be lifted up? His name and his words. 137. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways even before a word is on my tongue before behold O Lord you know it altogether you hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me such knowledge is too wonderful for me it is high I cannot attain it where shall I go from your spirit or where where shall I flee from your presence if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness as light with you. If you, uh, if you formed my inward part, you needed me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it is, uh, it, it knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was being made in secret. Intri uh, intricately woven in the depth of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the day that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more, th uh, more than, than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, O man of blood. Depart from me. They speak against you, and malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them in my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and to see if there is, uh, there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way uh, in the way everlasting. 
God created me. God knows everything about me. Even before I was even formed, He's the one who crafted me. He's the one who forms me. He knows what I think, what I do. No matter where, where I go, no matter what I do, He's always there and watching over me. We think we can hide things from Him. Oh, if I'm here, He will not see me. No, He will see us everywhere, anywhere. This is what the, the author is saying. Well, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways, even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it together, altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is a high I cannot attain it. So God knows everything about me. Even before I say anything, He already knows what I was going to say because He knows my thought. Well, where shall I go from your spirit? Where can we hide from the Lord? Imagine, if we can think of God is always watching over me, can we do anything bad? Imagine, God is always watching over me. So imagine, not, not about God, where someone is watching over you all the time. <laughs> like, no matter what you do, it's like they're watching over you. Can you do anything bad? <laughs> you can't even do anything bad, even if someone is watching over you. God is doing this. God knows everything what we do, what we say. So we cannot hide from Him. Even if you go up to, you know, the far places, even depth, even show, he's there. He knows my thoughts. He knows what I do, what I will do. So should we be careful of what we say, what we do? Absolutely. Because he knows me. Even though I can, I can trick other people, I can hide things from others, but I can't do that with the Lord. He knows everything. Even though I may say like, hi, and you're smiling to the people you hate, right? You can just fake yourself. You can do that to other people, but you cannot fake to God because God knows your heart and He knows my heart as well. We can never flee from Him. So should we be honest with Him when we pray? Should we hide? If he, if he hide, do you think he does not know what we are thinking? He knows what we're thinking. So why should we not be just honest with him when we pray? Just say the way we feel. Say what we really want to say. There's nothing to hide. If he already knows me, there's nothing to hide, right? He already knows me. And look at the verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depth of the earth. Your eyes I saw my unformed substance. In the form, I was a, it have the, some substance. He already knew me. In your books were written, every one of them, the day that were formed for me, when yet uh, as yet there was none of them how precious to me are your thoughts O oh god how vast the sum of them if i would count them they are more th than the sand i uh, i awake and i am still with you yeah i pray that every one of us stay with the lord all the time and I really just wish that every one of us just be with the Lord. Verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David was brave enough to even pray like this. I don't think I can pray like this. <laughs> <laughs> because my heart is not pure at all. 
My heart is not pure at all. But he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. I, you know that I love you. We don't. We just don't say I love you, Lord. But there's no heart. But, but there's no love for the Lord. But if you say I love you, Lord, we are smiling and I say, oh, how precious. But nothing is precious in my heart. He knows. Why lie? If he already knows. Let's be honest with the Lord. And just honest that we're not pure. Honest, but we love him. Jump to 141. O well, Lord, I call upon you. Haste, uh, hasten to me. Give me, uh, give ears to my voice when I call you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you. And the lifting up of my hands as the uh, evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. This is one of the things that I also pray. Lord, put a watch guard over my lips. Be careful of what I say, especially when I actually preach. Lord, help me not to say things I shouldn't be saying. Because I have to be very careful of what I say. This is something we have to be very careful because what we say can comfort people, but at the same time, what we say could hurt others, right? We have to be extremely careful of what we say. And especially when we actually teach others, be careful of what you say. Do not let my heart incline to any evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds, in company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their uh, delicacies. When you think of it, the bad works, wicked works, are sweeter than righteous work. It is a sweeter. This is why people do wicked things. But let me not eat of their delicacies. Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. So listen. Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Sometimes when you're actually saying the right thing, right, we don't want to hear. Why? Because that hurts me. Right? When we try to just discipline our kids, it hurts our kids. But we're saying things because they need to hear it. Because eventually, what we discipline, we hope that it will lead them to the right path. So sometimes the right things are hurting me. But we should not refuse those righteous as saying the right things to us. Even though it's painful, even though it hurts me, we should listen if God speaks to us. So remember, do not refuse. This is exactly what the Israelites did. When Jeremiah the prophets spoke to the Israelites, his own people, they didn't want to hear it. Why? Because they didn't like the way that way the Jeremiah was a saying. It is important when God speaks to us, even through some of people that we know, we need to listen. We need to have attentive ears to listen what God has to say to us. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. When their judges are thrown over the cliff, then they shall hear my words, for they are pleasant. 
As when one plows and breaks up the earth, so shall our bones be scattered at the mouth of Sheol. But my eyes are towards you, O God, my Lord, in you I seek refuge. Leave me not defenseless. Keep me from the trap that they have laid for me and from the snares of evil, evil doers. Let the wicked fall into their own net while I pass by safely. So when the wicked do the, you know, things, the evil things, they may enjoy from their own fruits. It may look nice. It may look actually good in our eyes. But you know what? Eventually, they will be destroyed for what they did. So we should never be envy of them. Chapter 142, with my voice I cried out to the Lord, and with my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I poured out my complaint before Him. I tell my trouble before Him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have a hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry, to you, I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attempt to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring, bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bount, uh, bountifully with me. When David was in the uh, the cave, chased by the Saul. He was in pain. The life was very difficult. So he was crying out to the Lord. But what is he saying? He's saying, Why aren't you not listening to me? How come you're not there for me? That's not what he's saying. What is he saying instead? I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Even though God did not help him, even though he was a still chased by the King Saul, he will never forget that God is his own refuge. He does not trust it, all the people around him, but rather he put all his trust in the Lord. And what did he do at the end? He praised the Lord, for he is good. It is very difficult unless you have a very strong faith. Because when we're in trouble, right, we give up on our faith. David, on the other hand, did not give up. He was holding on to the Lord. He never forget that God is my refuge. He is my God. He will deliver me, no matter what situation I'm in. Even though God did not do anything when David was chased and he, he had to live in the cave. Would you like to live in a cave? I don't. I don't think I'll be pleased. Dave lived in a cave for a very, very long time. Chapter 143, we're getting close. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ears to my plea for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Is there anyone righteous? No, no one is righteous. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, no one is righteous. None of us are righteous. But when we believe in Jesus Christ and when we're saved, when our sins are cleansed, we are called to be righteous. We did not become righteous, but we are called to be righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. No one is righteous except Jesus. For the enemy has 
pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore, my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is uh, upheld. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretched out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a, a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Hide not, my, uh, hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear in the morning of your steady fast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for, uh, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your God's Spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sakes, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. And in your steady fast love, you will cut off my enemies, and you will destroy all the adversary of my soul, for I am your servant. So, once again, when you listen to uh, David's psalm, he's definitely been chased by the uh, King Saul. Right? When the opportunity come, when the opportunity really came to him, did he actually kill King Saul? He had a two opportunity to kill to kill King Saul, but he refused to kill. Even if he the when he actually you know preserved his life for the first time, right? And then after did King Saul chase after him after that? He did. And second time, the opportunity came. Did he kill him? No, he did not. He refused to kill the anointed one. Even though the opportunity came, he refused. Even though he's crying out like this, he knew not the way he judged, not the way he does, but God will judge him, not him. Remember, we're not the judge. We're not the one who actually you know, uh, judge anyone. God is. We have to let God handle it, not me. So verse 8 says, Let me hear in the morning of your steady fast love for you. I trust. Make me know the way I should go. For to you I lift up my soul. This is one of my prayer too. One fourteen, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who re, uh, trains uh, trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steady fast love, and my fortress, my stronghold, and my deliverer, my shield, and He is whom I take refuge, who subdue people under me. O Lord, what is man that you regard him, or the son of man? That is uh, that you think of him. Man is like a breath; his days are like a passing shadow. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Flesh forth and lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrow and rout you uh, rout them. Stretch out your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me from the many waters. From the hand of foreigners, whose mouth speaks lies, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood, I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a ten-stringed harp I will play to you, who gives a victory to kings, who rescued David, his servant, from the cruel sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners." Whose mouth speaks lies, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. May our sons in their youth be like plentiful grown, our daughters like cor uh, corners, pillars, cut for the structure of the place. May our granaries be full, providing all kinds of produ uh, produce. May our sheep bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. 
May our cattle be heavy with young, suffering no mishap or failures in bearing. May there be no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed are the people to whom such blessing falls. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. So when you look at the uh, chapter 144, just like what David's been saying all along for most of his psalms, he starts with, Blessed, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trained my hand, uh, hands for war and my fingers for battles. He's steady, fast love, and my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I take refuge, whom subdue people under me. So he knows who God is. So he takes refuge and he think of Lord as his rock but at the same time he says oh Lord what is a man that you regard him or the son of man that you think of him man is like a breath his days are like a passing shadow what is he saying we're nothing I'm nothing but why do you think of me why do you really just care for me why do you protect me why do you actually always just love me I'm nothing, but you always love me. No matter what I do, no matter who I am, you love me. you always there for me. Thank you, Lord. This is one of the things or the confessions that we have. One forty five I will extol you, my God and King. And bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and great to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your work to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness they shall pour forth and frame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness the Lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steady fast love the Lord is good to all and his mercies over all that he has made all your work shall give thanks to you O Lord and all your saints shall be bless you they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell your power to make known to the children of many uh, men your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endure throughout all generation. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord unholds all who are uh, falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due seasons. You open your hand, your uh, satisfied desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, the kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who calls on him, to all who calls on him in truth. He fills the desire of those who fear him. He who hears their cry and save them. The Lord preserve all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. His kingdom will last forever. This kingdom that we live, the country that we have, will not last forever. But his kingdom will last forever. And then what? Verse 13 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endure throughout all generation. We need to be under His dominions, His authority, His control. That's where we live. Verse 14 says, The Lord upholds all who are falling and raise up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due seasons. You open your hands, your steady, fast desire of every living things. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him. 
to all who call on him in truth. This is the key word. We call on him, just crying out to him, just for help because I need help right away. Or do we call on him in truth? Remember, we talked about God knows my heart. So there is a difference between people who just seek for help because they need help right away. For those are the people who really cried out for their help, but only for these, their, their help, when they get help, what happens? They just walk away. Imagine, when people crying out for help, why they're crying out for help? Because they want to get out of that situation. But they don't really seek the Lord for any other reason. They just call Lord as if they're calling genies from the Aladdin lamp. They want to answer. They want the Lord to answer. That's all they want. Just help me here. Get me out of here. That's it. When I'm hungry, I need you to give me food. Once they get food, that's it. They don't think about it because they're not hungry anymore. Imagine, when do you pray? Do you really pray and you seek the Lord when things are really well? Or do you really pray when you're in trouble? But do you really seek the Lord with your heart? Or you seek the Lord because you need help? We need to seek the Lord. What is he saying here? The Lord is near to all who calls on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. That's the important part. I also mentioned this before. When you turn to uh, John chapter 14, John chapter 14, people like verse 14, John chapter 14 verse 14 says this, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. People love this verse. But you know what? There's something before. So, let's take a look at what he says. When you go all the way up, in chapter 14 let not your hearts be troubled believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many rooms if it were not so would I have not told you that I would go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am you may be also and you know the way to where I am going Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we say, uh, how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have know, known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you uh, so long and you still do not know me, Phillips? Whoever has seen me has seen Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Do you not believe that I am in Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works that I uh, then these will uh, 
he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my, my name, this will do, and the Father may be glorified in the sons. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So when you read what he said previously, if there's a difference between just memorizing verse 14 verses, reading through the entire chapter 14. Is this about like when you, when you want to have a something, just pray and God will give it to you anything? Is that what this, what is he saying? There is nothing to do with it. But they just take everything away from all the things what God, Jesus said, and then just take a look at verse 14. Oh, God said, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So that means he was going to give me anything I want. No, that's not what he said. That's definitely not what he said. And he said, verse, uh, chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What is the condition? If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. That's the condition. If you don't have that condition, if you take that off, and then only remembers the latter part of it, that's not what Jesus said. So, before we ask anything, we need to abide in Him, in Jesus, and my words abide in us. If you really just abide in Jesus and the word is abiding in us, we're just going to ask for like, give me, you know, make sure that, you know, uh, help me to just like, you know, win the lottery. Would you pray that? They have no idea what Jesus is saying. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what the Bible said. If you really know God's words, if you know who Jesus is, you will, nev you will never pray like that. Knowing who He is. Alright, coming back to Psalm. So just remember, Verse 18, once again, I just emphasize it. Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. Chapter 146. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. And I mentioned many, many times, should we trust a man? Should you trust me? No, I'm not trustworthy. Men are not to be trusted, not to mention about prince. Men are not to be trusted. Bible never say trust in man, but rather trust in the Lord. Because He's the only one who doesn't change. He doesn't change His promise. He doesn't change from the beginning to the end. But a man, we always change. We always change. So when you look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22, it says this, Stop regarding man in whose nostril is breath, for of what account is he? What is he saying? Men are not to be trusted, but God is. Coming back, 146, verse 4. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth, on that every day, He's plans perish. Bless is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. So we put all our trust in the Lord. 
Who made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, who keeps a faith forever, who executes justice to the oppressed, who gives a food for the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He holds uh, the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God of Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. So, I emphasize one more time. Yes, we trust our friend. Yes, we trust our wife. Yes, we trust our husband. Yes, we trust our parents. Yes, we trust our children. But that trust always breaks. That's why it hurts you. Because you put trust with man, and they will always hurt you. Not because they want to intentionally hurt you, because that's who we are. We're never steady fast. We change things. Even all of us. So that's why we can't trust man. I ask these questions to you. Do you trust yourself? Whatever you actually decide, you always execute? No, you don't. I know, because I do the same thing. I can't trust myself. Because I said I'll do this, I, there are many times that I, I don't do it. So I know I can't trust. If I can trust myself, how can I tell others to trust me if I can't even trust myself? The men are not to be trusted. Only God is. The Lord is the only one who's who are to be trusted, not a man. One forty seven. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praise to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their name. Great is our Lord, our abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up and uh, lifts up the humbles. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes the grass grow on the hills. He gives to the bees their food and to, do, uh, and to the young raven that cries. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor he pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him, in those who hope in His steady fast. Once again, for verse, verse 10 and 11 is very important for us to remember. What would, let's read again. Uh, he delights, he delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him, in those who hope in His steadfast love. This is what I said before. The people who trust themselves, that they believe that they can do, uh, they can do it by themselves, God does not help them. Because you, th you trust your own leg, you trust your own power, you trust your, your own wisdom and your knowledge. There's no room for God to help you. You will never get help. But for those of the people who put trust in the Lord and takes pleasure in those who fear Him, God will help them. Verse 12, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your, uh, praise your God, Zion. For He strengthened the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. He, his word runs sweetly. He gives a snow like wool. He scatters a frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumb. He who stands before he is cold, he sends out his word and melts them. 
He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his words of Jacob, ye statues and rules to Israel. He has not dealt though with any other nations. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. One forty eight. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all your shining stars. Praise him, your height is, uh, highest the heavens, and your waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave, he, uh, he gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great, uh, you, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire, fire and hail, snow and mist, the stormy winds, fulfilling His words, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth will, and all people, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His majesty is above, above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for His people. Praise for His uh, saints, for the people of Israel who are near to Him. Praise the Lord. The interesting part is, everything else God created praised Him, except man. Everything God created Stars, heavens, seas, creatures, above, below, they all praise, except man. Only few men praise the Lord. And God loves those people. God did not create seas and creatures and promise He will save. Only to the man. But men are the one who rebel the most. 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in His Maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their kings. Let them praise His name with dancing, making melody to Him with tambourines and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He adorns the humbles and salvation. Let the godly exalt in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high priest of God, a praise of God, be in their throat, and two-edged sword in their hands, to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written this is honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. So when you look at it from chapter 146, it's all about praising the Lord. From the 146 through the last chapter of the Psalms, it's all about praise, praising the Lord. So the, the Psalms with ends with praising. When we enter into the, the heavens, when we enter into his rest, what we will do is praise the Lord. This is how it ends. 150 the same. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sounds. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourines and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud uh, clashing cymbals. Let every, everything that has breath praise the Lord praise the Lord so psalm literally ends with praise this is what we will do when we are living with him when we enter into his peace we will be actually praising the Lord sometimes actually people ask me it's like oh that's boring we'll be praising him forever oh that's like boring I don't want to go there that you don't understand you don't understand When you are actually in love, either man or woman, 
what do they actually say to the other loved one? They always just say something good and praising about what they do. When you're in love. When you're truly in love, that's what you do. And when we enter into His peace, that's what we will do. Praise the Lord. And His greatness, His steadfast love, everything what He did, what He's doing, we'll always praise. And that's exactly what King David did. When you look at all the Psalms that he wrote, at the end, he praised the Lord. For He's good. For He's a steadfast love forever. We hope that we actually continue to do the same thing like King David did.